Hello, Exalted Ones. Here we are with issue 74. Let's go ahead and get started and we'll review this issue. The first thing we have is the Terrapin class bulk tanker. And um, you'll learn quickly why it was affectionately known as the turtle tanker. The Terrapin class bulk transport uh, known colloquially as the Turtle Tanker, was a permanent fixture in the lanes of the Outer Rim Territories. Valued for its sizable cargo capacity and quick loading facility, the vessel was equally admired for its all-terrain landing capabilities. Thanks to its four hydraulic legs, the tank, uh, Turtle Tanker could land on certain, oh, excuse me, land on terrain that would simply be impossible for standard transports. The combination of these qualities made the First Little Tanker, a highly desirable vessel for commerce on the lesser developed worlds of the Outer Rim. So the designation is a TRRL, um, a Terrapin class bulk tanker. It's from the Alateen Yards, um, 38.2 meters long, so a little bit longer than the, the Falcon. Its height is uh, 910 meters, though, so it's much taller than it is long. Uh, its height depth is 26.1 meters. So uh, that's its ratio, I guess. Class is a transport walker hybrid. It's got a hyperdrive, one escape craft, and one escape pod. Design and popularity. Designed and built by the engineers of the Alateen, Alateen Yards, the Turtle Tanker was built to fulfill the bold promises made by a number of its smaller and less successful predecessors built by uh, Alantine's uh, competitors. Marrying the toughness and durability of, for example, Roth Rothana's ground vehicles with the ingenious design cues of the likes of the Sando Dynamics successful heavy transport series, the new transport walker hybrid certainly did fulfill those promises. Despite being a relatively small firm, Alantine Yards handled the marketing masterfully and was backed up with impressive performances for their vehicles. Among their features, the TRTL3, if you look at that, uh, that actually kind of says turtle. So, kind of funny. The TRTL3 was a champion for its simple but effective uh, partitioning system built into the design of the ship which allowed for a variety of diverse cargoes to be transported at any one time. For example, while commonly pressed into service as a waste disposal vessel, the TRTL-3 was equipped at, equally at home transporting livestock such as wrath tars, rancors, or reeks to and from other all corners of the galaxy. First time seeing mention of the Wrath Tars, so I would guess that they pulled that in from The Force Awakens to add that in here. Some were fitted out to carry foodstuffs to outlying systems and many captains secreted cargoes of illegally, illegal weaponry around the ship behind false walls and under false floors for extra profit. Less scrupulous captains were known to transport captives, passing them onto many slavers who plied their seedy trade on the <coughs> peripheries of the rim, allowing simply fitted, others simply fitted them out as, a, as public transports, allowing paying uh, passengers to access locations with more challenging terrain. Another popular feature was the location of the transport's engines, which were housed within all-terrain hydraulic legs. The rationale behind the design was well thought out, and it's benefits twofold. Previous Walker transport hybrids had been fitted with dedicated engine bays to the rear of the ship, like those on the spaceship, like those on a spaceship, uh, resulting in a reduction of cargo capacity. Alantine's engineers put, for, put forth their design as a way to both save internal space and, crucially, argue that the vehicle could be categorized in the cheaper band of land-based vehicles with aerial capabilities, and not the other way around. The company's legal team successfully exploited the, this loophole, 
significantly reducing costs, permits, and fees, and making the turtle tanker even more desirable to operators on, on the lanes. <clears throat> outer rim specialists, it was in the outer rim where sophisticated docking facilities and spaceports are at a minimum. That the TR, uh, TRTL, I'm just going to start saying turtle, that the turtle really came into its own. Independent operators began using the turtle tanker more and more, sending the transports out to the most inhospitable locations with a view to eke out the maximum profit from each world. Without the requirement of a landing platform, costs were lessened still further, and the knowledge that the turtle could walk its way through most terrain to a suitable and safe position for its cargo to be loaded or unloaded. With one and two man operations, a common site in the mid and outer rim territories, the fact that a turtle required only a single crew member was yet another bonus. As such, cargo operations rarely employed more than three crew crewmen to any one tanker, knowing that the offloading systems could be operated automatically. In times of danger, the cockpit could detach into a separate escape vessel, giving the small crew time to escape, to avoid the loss of the ship or its cargo in such an evacuation designers had been designers had even fitted the tanker with capable autopilot able to return the ship to its designated primary port mission to lotho minor conduct uh, conducting much of its business in the mid rim and outer rim territories the turtle tanker saw all manner of worlds on its travels one such tanker was on its way to the outer rim planet of stobar to the junk world of Lotho Minor, close to the Coda Spur hyperspace route, when it was hijacked by the Dark Warrior Savage Opress. With little option, the craft's Sakian captain flew Opress to Lotho Minor, where the Zabrak intended to search for his long-lost brother Darth Maul. Upon reaching their destination, the captain was brutally discarded high above the twisted metal junk piles of the planet thrown mercilessly from the airlock at altitude. Despite losing the skilled pilot, Opress managed to land the tanker safely and continued to search for his lost brother using the tanker's walking ability. Pretty cool. <clears throat> Inspiration behind the turtle tanker came from a somewhat unlikely source. Supervising Director Dave Filoni needed a unique, versatile craft in which Savage Opress could Traverse the treacherous and jagged metal canyons of the junk planet Lotho Minor while searching for his long lost brother Maul in season four of the Clone Wars. The vehicle developed to track this journey was the Turtle Tanker, a hybrid walker transport whose inspiration largely came from Filoni's pet turtle, Goji. Looking at the tanker, it's easy to see how, uh, how much the physiology of the turtle inspired the final design. The cockpit sits low on the body and appears to peek out of the larger protective hold above, much like a turtle head pokes out of the shell, while small but agile legs protrude from the underside of the vehicle to provide locomotion. Now that's pretty interesting. The, the places where they get ideas from. Christophysis Crystal World. The outer rim world of Christophysis was, for a long time, left largely untouched. The regular and devastating meteor showers from its three main asteroid belts dissuading many settlers from choosing the place as their home. Still, some persevered, eking out a perilous existence on the world, and for protection building their homes into the sides of towering blue crystals that covered the planet's surface. Then, at some point in the history of Christophus, so distantly remembered that it had almost become Prospector's legend, the planet's fortunes took, took a turn for the better with heavy investment from a number of wealthy families from the core worlds. This investment paid for the taming of the asteroids with high-tech and expensive vaporizing techniques used to strategically used strategically to stabilize the belts, making them safer to enter and consequently far easier to mine. 
Before long, asteroid mining had become the main source of income for the world, and the investors, now confirmed as Christophsis' ruling elite, became enormously wealthy, residing in opulent mansions also built in the crystalline towers of the planet. However, things were to take a rapid turn for the worse when war broke out. Christophus' location in the Outer Rim made the planet a vital strategic location as soon as war broke out. In the weeks following the first engagement of the conflict that would become known as the Clone Wars, fought on Geonosis, found factions vied to take control of most military of the most military important worlds and systems. It was inevitable that Christophus, with its abundance of natural resources, should become a target for both sides. War comes to Christophus. If nothing else, it's fun to say. The outbreak of war would could uh, could turn the fortunes of any world on its head, but perhaps nowhere in the history of the galaxy has this been more starkly realized than on Christophus. In the weeks after the first full-scale engagement of the Clone Wars fought between the Republic's newly acquired clone army and the droid forces of the Confederacy of Independent Systems on Geonosis, both sides rushed to assert control of the Outer Rim. All of a sudden, the combination of factors that had made Christophsis such a prosperous world, its primary location on the busy Corellian run hyperspace lane, plus its abundance of valuable natural resources, went from being a blessing to a curse as a separatist leader, General Warm Loathsome, and Admiral Trench swiftly seized control of the planet. Loathsome's Loathsome leading the ground assault while Trench blockaded the planet from above. The planet's ruling elite, far more concerned with protecting their own wealth than protecting other, their people, simply fled the planet, safe in the knowledge that the Funds in their overworld, off-world bank accounts would see them just fine. Meanwhile, overrun by Loathsome's forces, the Christophsons uh, left on the planet sent a desperate rescue plea to the Republic before evacuating their cities to go into hiding, leaving the Separatists in control of the world. The Republic... Uh, the Republic duly sent a detachment of its new general, or excuse me, Grand Ad, uh, Army, led by Generals Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker to the planet. But with Admiral Trench's concerted blockade still in place, any hopes of mounting the successful release, relief operation looked slim. Then the ever-astute Skywalker devised a plan to use a, a new design of stealth ship to outwit and ambush Trench himself. With Anakin using the stealth technology to draw a separatist fire back into Onto Trench's flagship, the Admiral was taken out of action, leaving his blockading fleet leaderless. Taking instant advantage of this, the Republic launched an assault and routed the Separatists, gaining access to the surface of the planet at last. However, only half the job was done, and the Republic forces met fierce resistance from uh, Losom's droid army, who were camped out in the capital Caliadona, Donia. Baptism of Fire. The Battle of Christophsis was notable for being the first time that Anakin Skywalker was assigned a Padawan. A young to Togruta Jedi, Ahsoka Tano, was sent from the Jedi Temple to Christophsis, where she was, rece was received by a somewhat surprised Anakin. However, the new pairing of Master and Padawan would prove instrumental to the Republic's victory there with Tano helping Anakin disable the shield generator protecting Wilson's troops. Into battle. The Separatists were in full control of Caledonia, Wilson's command center being set up in an abandoned 23-story mansion there. So the Republic Army ground forces established its base outside of the city with Skywalker and Kenobi's clone troops all operating out of prefabricated barracks flown in by the Republic transports. It was a long, uh, tough time for the generals, and the situation was made worse when a spy embedded in their ranks sabotaged the munition hold. Their base compromised. The Republic uh, brought forward their plans and moved to assault the capital. 
Fighting was fierce, and the use of heavy artillery from both sides swiftly laid waste to much of the city. This included the destruction of many of the city's wide bridges, built to traverse the difficult crystalline terrain of the planet, making fighting conditions challenging. Shattered City By the time of the final showdown between the combatants and the main thoroughfare of the city, Caledonia lay in ruins, many of its grandest buildings shattered into crystalline splinters that littered the scene. The Republic troops themselves faced similar destruction when they found that even their heaviest weapons fire was useless against the powerful expanding energy shield Lothsome had erected to protect his droid tanks. However, in the nick of time, a quick-thinking Anakin, com accompanied by his new Padawan, Ahsoka Tano, managed to fight past the droid guards and disable shield generator, rendering the Separatist army suddenly vulnerable and forced into a rapid retreat. With no options left, General Wilson surrendered to the Republic and was take and was take to a, taken to a high security prison on Coruscant. Coming so soon after its victory at Geonosis, the Battle of Christophsis was seen as a major triumph for the Republic. However, it had come at enormous cost, laying waste to what had formerly been a prosperous and beautiful world. Clone Wars on Film Girls on Film Although taking place in the early stages of the Clone Wars, the battle fought on Christophsis between the Separatist forces of General Warm Losom and Admiral Trench and the Republic force led by Generals Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker featured features across the Clone Wars animated series. The moment Anakin is assigned his first Padawan, Ahsoka Tano, was shown in the feature-length film released prior to Season 1, but the Battle of Christophsis uh, itself is featured twice more in subsequent flashback episodes, being the setting for the 16th episode of both Series 1 and Series 2. For those that aren't familiar... In the UK, they, instead of seasons, they say series, so they treat each season as its own separate se series, I guess. But that's what they call them anyway. So that's where Ahsoka Tano came from. So again, if you haven't seen Clone Wars, highly recommend it. It's a very good show. Military Starship Classification Part 1, which tells me there will be a Part 2. Uh, the basics of naval combat uh, changed little from ships bob from when ships bobbed in the seas of innumerable planets to the time when they floated in the endless reaches of deep space. Small craft moved and turned quickly, but were vulnerable. Large ships maneuvered slowly, but packed a powerful punch. Even in the ocean-bound days, ships were divided into classes, and this tradition ha was continued. Determining the class of a starship was vital, allowing senior military commanders such as Admiral Akbar and Piat to plan an action, be it defensive or offensive. A commander's line of battle found a place for all ships. By assessing their strengths and weaknesses and assigning them to a uh, class accordingly. Sometimes those classifications would be generic across all battles, while at other times classes were particular to one engagement. For example, at the famous Battle of Endor, the Millennium Falcon was classified as a starfighter, leading and coordinating various fighter squadrons for the Rebel Alliance against the Empire. It achieved this despite its size, something that would ordinarily have been it have seen it assigned to the picket line. Uh, Clone War era Republic capital ships. So this first one is the Acclimator, it's a class assault ship. The predecessor of the first Star Destroyers, the Acclimator, was another example of a ship that had a varying role. If no Star Destroyers were present, it would fill the role of the main capital ship uh, in the group. Otherwise, it would be moved into a close support role. During planetary invasions, its principal role was to deliver troops to the front either by landing itself or by deploying squadrons of dropships. Lastly, the Acclimator could act as a carrier, launching and recovering starfighters. So there's the Acclimator. So it looks, you know, different kind of from that angle. If you look like that, it looks kind of like a, uh, uh, maybe some sort of a, shi uh, a fish or something. 
an arrowhead maybe even so looks kind of cool um the predecessor of the first oh uh, then we go to the venator class uh star destroyer which i've shown before that's the venator class uh the first of the star destroyers the venator was larger than the acclimator and soon replaced it in the line still able to land on a planet if necessary it was more un, more usual for them to remain in orbit these were the vessels that manned Republic blockades and broke Separatist ones. So there's the Venator class, and again, it looks very much like an arrowhead. Uh, Separatist capital ships. The mainstay of the Trade Federation fleet, these ships were converted freighters. Oh, the, this first one is the uh, Looser Hulk, and that's the big donut-looking thing, right? Uh, you would have seen that in uh, The Phantom Menace. Uh... Barely able to handle combat with other capital ships, they were dropped in, into close support roles or left to focus on launching uh, droid fighters and ground troops. So there you go. Um, then we get into the Providence class carrier destroyer. The most famous of the Pro of the Providence class vessels was the Invisible Hand, the flagship of General Grievous at the Battle of Coruscant. Providence ships had large hangars for launching and recovering starfighters but had the shields and firepower to handle close combat with other capital ships I had one beginning of the sentence here um, there often disposable ships acted as early warning vessels monitoring approaching enemy the falcon though was fast enough and maneuverable enough to keep up with and occasionally outpace and outfly the agile starfighters of the Alliance. The main battle line at the core of any fleet were the big ships of the line. The capital class vessels, often referred to as cruisers, these ships were the big hitters and generally included the command vessel or flagship of the overall commander of any given naval action. In combat, these ships could be slow to commit themselves. This was simply because they took a great deal of time and space to maneuver. Certainly, compared to smaller ships, everything they did had to be carefully planned well in advance, requiring significant tactical skill on the part of their commanders to read the way the battle was going. Whether maneuvering for advan uh, advantage or closing and on the enemy, the tactics of capital class combat were focused on preventing, presenting as small a profile as possible to the enemy while maximizing the damage potential of their own weapons. Cruisers were designed to soak up immense am amounts of damage and to dish it out too. In most engagements, there came a point where when opposing capital vessels would engage in trading broadsides, Sitting side by side, pounding away with all their weapons until one or the other ship was crippled, destroyed, or withdrew. Getting caught in the crossfire of such an engagement was deadly for smaller ships. When Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin rushed to rescue, rushed to the rescue of Chancellor Palpatine from the Separatist flagship Invisible Hand during the Battle of Coruscant towards the end of the Clone Wars, they had to negotiate the maelstrom of weapons, fire, debris, and explosions that made the space over the galactic capital a lethal obstacle. During the rescue, a Republic Star Destroyer was hammering the opposing ship with broadsides, making the job of the Jedi the, that bit harder. Imperial Era Rebel Alliance Capital Ships Built by the Mon Calamari, the MC-80 Star Cruiser, which I think we've talked about before, uh, these ships were credited as having saved the Republic Alliance. Though not as large as a Star Destroyer, their unique overlapping shield configuration and powerful weapons clusters made them almost a match for the Imperial warships. At the Battle of Endor, an MC-80 called Home One served as the flagship for the Rebel Fleet Commander Admiral Akbar. The EF-76 Nebulon B Escort Frigate. Although perfectly capable of acting as escort frigates, their original purpose, the Rebel Alliance more famously used them as medical frigates. 
They were heavily armed to act as escorts for transport ships and also had powerful tractor beams. Imperial capital ships. Uh, the Imperial 1 and 2 class Star Destroyers. Uh, brought in before the end of the Clone Wars when they were known as the Imperator class. Imperial 1 and 2 class Star Destroyers replaced the Venator class vessels of the Republic and quickly became the symbol of the Galactic Empire. These ships were carriers able to launch fighters, support vessels, and ground troops, but they were also terrifyingly capable uh, warships. A single Star Destroyer could easily dominate and control an entire star system. By far the most famous of these ships, the Ex Executor class Star Destroyer, uh, also called Super Star Destroyers, was the Executor. The flagship of, Des uh, of Darth Vader, it coordinated the hunt for the Rebel Alliance base and the destruction of that base at the Battle of Hoth. Later, at the Battle of Endor, the Executor was humbled when with its shields knocked out by the concentrated fire from multiple rebel capital ships, its main bridge was hit by a dying Alliance pilot. This caused the star, uh, Super Star Destroyer to crash into the surface of the second Death Star. New Republic Era First Order Capital Ships Dwarfing the Imperial II class, but smaller than the Mammoth Executor, the Resurgence were a direct violation of the treaty signed between the New Republic and the tattered remnants of the Empire. The First Order built these ships to last. Not having the seemingly endless resources of the Galactic Empire to call on, in many ways this made the First Order Star Destroyer, so well armored and shielded and frighteningly well armed, more dangerous than the more numerous Imperial equivalent. So there you go. That is all of the big ships. We will learn more about the smaller ones later. And that's everything in this uh, issue. So again, this is what we got this time. You saw what we put it together. Next time we'll be getting a couple more pieces of framework. So we'll be putting, I'm sure, putting that together. I'm guessing that's going to be the bottom part of the mandible. We're going to be getting some piping and another insert. So be able to put that with this one. Uh, at some point, we'll probably start putting those together. Um, so that's everything with issue 74. Next time, we'll be doing issue 75. With that, I want to say thank you all for watching, and may the Force be with you always.